Hello, and a warm welcome for our webinar today it goes out to our customers, students, interested engineers, and last but not least, our competition. My name is Emilio Meza, and I am your moderator for today's webinar, How to Read an IGBT Datasheet. IGBT module datasheets are often a source of confusion. Therefore, we will step through the Simicron datasheet for a typical industrial IGBT module, explaining each term and providing insight into how they are used. Our goal today is to provide clarity for both entry-level and experienced engineers. Before we get started with the presentation, some words about our webinar platform. In case of any connection issues to the presentation stream or to the sound, please try to reconnect using the button on the very top of your browser window. In your browser on the right-hand side, you can see the chat window, which you can hide to increase the presentation window. In case you have any comments or difficulties, please let us know via the chat. All messages are private and only we can see them. If you have any questions about the content, please mark your comment as a question with the Q&A mode button. We will try to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Questions we do not manage to answer today will then be answered by email during the next days. Also, you can send us an email to webinar at semicron.com at any time, and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Finally, we will also share the slides as a PDF file at the very end of the presentation. You will see the download button just below the chat window. Your presenter today is Paul Drexich. Paul graduated from the Rochester Institute of Technology with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering in 2006. From 2007 to 2014, he worked as a design engineer in Simicron's Solutions Group, designing power electronic sub assemblies. Paul now serves as the applications manager and is responsible for troubleshooting existing systems and addressing new customers' designs. Enjoy the webinar. Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you, Emilio. This presentation is divided into two main sections, with each section representing the two sections of a data sheet. So first, we'll go through the absolute maximum ratings here, which if, could exceed, which if exceeded uh, could damage or destroy the device. Uh, but we'll see there are a couple of exceptions to what we call these maximum ratings. And then the second section is the characteristics, which define the behavior of the device. So starting with the data sheet we'll be looking at today, in this presentation, we're going to be looking at a standard industrial power module uh, with a half bridge or GB circuit. Um, and in that circuit, there's two IGBTs, each with uh, an inverse or anti-parallel or freewheeling diode, whatever you prefer. Uh, and the terms in the data sheet refer to either uh, the IGBT or the diode. You'll see there's different subscripts. Uh, and in this particular configuration we're looking at today, um, the upper and lower IGBTs are identical and the uh, upper and lower diodes are identical. Uh, so we'll only be talking about one of each device. Uh, and also when I'm referring to a device, I'm referring to the effective switch, either IGBT or diode, even if that device is made up of many parallel chips inside the module. So again, this is a 450 amp, 1200 volt Semix 3P module that we're looking at today. Starting with maximum ratings and the voltage, the first item at the top of the data sheet is the blocking voltage of the semiconductor. So it's VCES for uh, the IGBT and VRRM for the diode. And this is a standard value uh, across most power module manufacturers and serves as a way of broadly categorizing power modules. So we'll be talking about 600 volt or 1200 volt or 1700 volt modules. Uh, when we do that, we're referring to this blocking voltage. So this is defined as the maximum voltage the device can block in its off state or in its reverse state uh, without exceeding a given leakage current, ICES, uh, which you'll see is stated later on in the characteristics section. So for example, for this IGBT, it's 5 milliamps. Uh, in the case of the uh, anti-parallel diode that we've paired with this IGBT. Uh, the voltage rating you can see is the same as the IGBT it's paired with. Uh, 
So when we switch off an IGBT, it creates a voltage spike due to inductances in the system. And these voltage spikes uh, that occur above our DC link voltage uh, cannot exceed that peak value. And what that means practically is that uh, for uh, your application, that the maximum steady state DC bus or DC link voltage should be much lower than VCES. And so typically we'd say two thirds of VCES. So you might run up to an 800 volt bus uh, in North America here, if you're doing grid tie stuff where you're pushing power back in the grid, that might be up to 850 volts or something like that. But it all depends on how well you can manage your inductances in your systems. Um, given the importance of course of this parameter, this is. 100% tested on, on every module uh, that's, uh, that we produce. Uh, the next voltage is the gate voltage uh, that we're looking at here. So the IGBT gate, which is comprised of a thin oxide layer, uh, we switch on and off a positive, uh, we switch on the device with a positive voltage and we switch it off with a negative voltage. So hence you see a uh, polarity here. And in this case, this 20 volt maximum uh, should be seen as like a DC or steady state limit. And but you have to be aware that uh, any overshoot in the gate circuit uh, during uh, operation uh, will may, may exceed this due to issues with the, uh, the gate, your, your uh, gate inductance and things like that. And so repeatedly exceeding that by a few volts will start to cause long term degradation of the oxide and um, exceeding that by a large amount will cause an immediate breakdown of that gate oxide. Uh, also note that when we get into the characterization that we characterize our uh, devices with an on state gate voltage of 15 volts and that's uh, that's a practical uh, limit I think for us because we'll find that when you start to push that to higher uh, voltages you run into some of the issues that I just described. Now, uh, the following values here are ones that are saying are not exactly absolute maximums. So the nominal current, IC nom or IF nom, in the case of uh, the diode, refer to the direct current rating of all of the paralleled IGBT or diode chips that make up a single switch. So this value is carried over from the chip level data sheet. Uh, so for example, in the case of this 450 amp module, we're looking at three 150 amp IC nom chips are paralleled to give us this 450 amp value. And you'll note that it's not specified at any uh, case temperature here uh, because this comes from the data sheet for an unpackaged chip. So you really want to think of the nominal current value as a way of characterizing the module much in the same way we use the blocking voltage. So again, this is a 1200 volt, 450 amp module. The nominal current is also used as a reference value at which switching characteristics are measured and is used to derive other values such as the uh, repetitive maximum collector current that we'll show in a minute. Uh, in practice, the effective current that you can get out of a module in a circuit will be less than IC nom, that is, you know, the RMS or DC value, uh, because we're not considering switching with this value. But it's also possible that you could exceed this value during transients. So again, not a true maximum, but unfortunately it comes in the maximum section. Uh, uh, sort of related to that uh, is this other, let's call it a uh, theoretical value here, ICIF that you see are given for case vet temperatures. So this is somewhat of a legacy value that many manufacturers use to uh, uh, compare devices. It's a calculated value using the maximum forward characteristics, which we'll show in a bit, uh, with a fixed case temperature to derive a current where the semiconductor temperature uh, reaches its maximum value. And it should really only be used for device comparison. And it's not that practical because it doesn't consider switching losses. Okay. And, and it's also uh, practically impossible in, in, with most heat sinks to keep the case temperature at 25 degrees or even 80 degrees with two to three kilowatts of power dissipation uh, in each device. But you can see here how this can be calculated uh, from the data sheet values uh, under the characteristics section. <clears throat> 
The next two values are the allowable surge currents for the device, both repetitive, that R here, and non-repetitive down here. Uh, and you can see this is based off the nominal current rating here on the right. So uh, for this particular chip generation, it's three times IC nom. Um, so this, this is the maximum repetitive pulse current the chip can see without occurring, incurring any aging effects to the topside metallization or things like that. But it is given independent of chip temperature. For example, we might want to use this, this module in a pulsed circuit, like for a power supply for a medical system or a laser. And perhaps we want to put very short pulses of 1,000 amps through the module. 1,000 amps is less than 1,350 here, so that's OK. But we would have to calculate the junction temperature that occurs during each pulse to make sure we're not exceeding uh, the operating temperature. And, you know, again, we'll cover that in a minute. For the diode, we have the surge current rating, OK? Because IGBT could turn itself off in the event of a fault. A diode cannot. And so for this, we have this IFSM rating, uh, which is used for looking at short circuit uh, uh, protection and for sizing fuses. And it's very important to realize that for that non-repetitive surge, this is only rare cases. And we can get up to very high temperatures in the die and uh, aging, uh, aka damage, starts to occur to the device. Uh, uh, so short circuit behavior. So when a short circuit is applied to an IGBT in the on state, the current will rise quickly. And due to the positive temperature coefficient of the device, the IGBT will start to pull out of saturation, effectively self-limiting the current to perhaps uh, six times the IC nom value. Energy is dissipated, and the short, short circuit withstand time limits this energy to an allowable value. Uh, and although you can calculate a theoretical energy as shown here, uh, the right way to use the short circuit time value here, 10 microseconds in this case, uh, is to ensure that your short circuit protection circuit, so DSAT, or dynamic short circuit protection, uh, or what have you, uh, turns off the IGBT within that time given. So for most silicon IGBTs, this is not so big a task. But as chips are getting smaller, thinner, and faster, uh, this short circuit time has been decreasing. So short circuit withstand time is a IGBT generation specific parameter. And in newer devices, this could be 5 microseconds, as in the case of some faster 650 volt chips. Or in the case of silicon carbide devices, which we're not covering here, it might be even lower, uh, aka zero microseconds, which means that such devices don't really have any inherent short circuit tolerance. Now, one of the most important things on the sheet here is temperatures. So this is another chip generation specific value, uh, which is junction temperature, which refers to the semiconductor junction uh, inside the chip. And so this TJ value you see here, um, I'm showing under the inverse die, uh, uh, but it's also, you know, there's a value for the IGBT. Um, this refers to the uh, maximum allowable temperature during operation of the chip, which could be uh, a hot spot on a single chip out of a number of chips in par parallel. So because of this and the difficulties of measuring this value, you'll see on the next slide that we have a lower uh, unofficial value for operating. All right, so this is the absolute maximum. For uh, be beyond the chip itself, right, because this is just the chip value, we, when we look at the module, the module itself has a allowable temperature range. And we call this the storage temperature, TSTG, uh, because this is uh, used uh, uh, during transportation, assembly, and storage of the module. But it also has some consequences during operation. So you can see that the maximum junction temperature for the, the module here is lower than the junction temperature, as obviously there's some temperature gradient between the chip and the housing, uh, such that the housing will never see the same maximum temperature as the, the chip itself. 
Furthermore, uh, on the module, if you have uh, pre-applied thermal interface material, such as a phase change material, the upper limit may be uh, lower to prevent that material from flowing prior to assembly, like in the case of a phase changer. And then on the lower end of the range, it's the internal, it's basically the internal silicone gel that's used for insulation that limits this because that gel uh, can freeze and crack, which might result in voids when the device heats back up, which would compromise your insulation. So uh, perhaps the most important topic out of this presentation is the difference between uh, maximum TJ, which we just covered, which is a data sheet value and TJ op or TJ operating. And uh, there's some confusion about this, but um, if you look at an infrared image of an IGBT chip or diode chip from the top here, you can see there's a temperature gradient across the surface, right? So we're looking at this diagonally from left to right. And you can see that uh, the temperature gradient there looks like this as some shadows due to the gate. And the peak temperature we actually see on there is 118 degrees uh, Celsius. However, if we want to measure the voltage drop across the chip and calculate the temperature based on the positive temperature characteristic of the, the IGBT, which is what we as module manufacturers do during qualification and what uh, many users do during testing of the device, we will get a lower value representing an average temperature across the chip. So you can see here that that uh, temperature as measured by the VCEO as a function of, uh, function of TJ method is 104 degrees see here. And uh, so that's just for looking at this one chip. And if we have multiple chips in parallel to make up a single switch, we're actually calculating the average temperature across all of these chips. So that is why all major power semiconductor module manufacturers, semi Semicron and, and competitors, uh, really specify, well, uh, uh, suggest a buffer between this maximum junction temperature and the maximum operating temperature. And for modern IGBTs, it's 25 degrees. So that means that for a 175C max degree device, the designer should ensure that the calculated junction temperature does not exceed 150 degrees C at any point during operation. Now, as you saw a couple slides back during short circuits and, and non-typical events, you will get higher temperatures in there, but as a design point, you should really be looking at uh, the, that 25 degree margin. And you can see as uh, in newer chip generations, as at TJ Maxx goes higher, our, our uh, TJ Op also goes higher as well. So the last few things to refer to in the, the maximum ratings for the module design are similar for a family of modules, uh, such as the Semix 3P family that this, this particular module is. So uh, for the maximum cur terminal current, IT RMS here, um, it's possible in a really high performance cooling system um, th that you're keeping the device temperature quite low uh, or if you're operating in usual configuration, like just direct current mode, right? You're not doing any switching and it's all conduction losses that you, rather than being limited by the temperature of the chip, instead you might be limited by just the cross-sectional area of the, the module and uh, of the, the terminal in the module and the in internal connections in there. So that's what this is. So most users don't run into this, but this is very important to consider when you're really uh, using an extreme cooling system or uh, in it, using it in a unique application. The isolation voltage, okay, is a safety pertinent term referring to the electrical isolation between the power circuit and the base plate, which contacts the heat sink and is usually at earth potential. Uh, so this is a test of the ceramic insulation system inside the module and is tested in our production line for every module. Um, this is a, uh, you see here, AC sinus 50 hertz for one minute. That's AC RMS. This is an RMS value. And uh, because repeated testing of high voltage uh, can be detrimental to any insulation barrier, right? You get partial discharge and things like that. It's recommended that any subsequent tests uh, that the user do as part of OEM production or field service uh, be done at a reduced voltage. And so that's covered in, in detail in another application note. 
Now we'll cover the characteristics of the, the device here. So the first is a little bit weird, but you can see this this in a minute, this refers to some uh, other things we're talking about. So it's best to talk, get these out of the way first. So uh, we're stuck with some uh, parasitic values that are things intrinsic to the module that we'd like to eliminate, but we're stuck with due to physics. And so the biggest one is the collector emitter uh, stray inductance here. And you can see it's a bulk uh, stray inductance here. And this causes, of course, a voltage spike uh, that uh, increases as current increases and switching times decrease, right? V equals L D I D T. Uh, and you can see that uh, this sort of, this stray inductance limits our safe operating area here based on where we're switching. Uh, and in addition to that uh, inductance, we also have a resistance in here. And this is the resistive element uh, consisting of the traces within the module, bond wires and connections. And while it generally doesn't uh, need to be worried for any thermal calculations, it does cause a small voltage drop that affects the measurement of the forward characteristics on the next slide here. Forward characteristics. So if VCE sat for the IGBT here, and we'll start with the IGBT, uh, collector emitter saturation voltage. And this is the value that shows the voltage drop across that IGBT during uh, conduction of nominal current, IC nom. Since it's given at that nominal current, it's often used by designers as an indicator of how good the conduction losses on a particular chip generation or power module are. And so, uh, this is valid for chip level, as you can see here, and it does not include that voltage drop across the parasitic resistances I just talked about. And so, as, as I'll show you in a minute for the diode, if you want to measure that voltage drop at the power terminals, you'll need to add the effect of that resistance. Um, so while VCE SAT is useful for comparing module data sheets or chip generations, for actually calculating the conduction losses uh, we use a two-parameter model. So if you look at the forward characteristics of the device, and we have it for both temperatures here, you know, collector emitter voltage here and nominal, and uh, um, uh, collector current here, you can see that uh, we take a, we make a straight line approximation through that line, making a line through the nominal current, 450 amps, and 25% of the nominal current, and the inverse slope of that line becomes this slope resistance that we have here. And the intersection of that line with the x-axis becomes this VCE0 value here. Similarly, for the diode, it's, it's the exact same case, right? The same principles apply. We have a forward voltage drop at a nominal current. And as you can see, there's a temperature dependency uh, that you can look at here with that can be uh, uh, estimated with a linear estimation uh, and you can derive it from that 150 degree C point and that 25 degree C point. And um, same thing applies with that straight line approximation I just talked about where we can draw a line in here uh, to, to get that uh, slope resistance. Um, but in the case of a diode here, note that that intersection of that line here that with the x-axis that gives you your VF0 uh, voltage here, that's going to be bigger than the threshold voltage that uh, uh, you would expect for a diode, right? because you're not actually hitting that that uh, knee point there where it pulls off the x-axis. You're a little bit in front of it because of that straight line approximation. Again, these values do not include the parasitic resistances we talked about. Um, and uh, it's important to figure out what to do with that. And in the case of the characteristic curves, on our data sheet. So at the top of the data sheet, we have the characteristics. And at the end of the data sheet, we have the curves. We've plotted out some of these values and you can see maybe a little difficult on your screen. It says, including RCC and EE. So what that means is we give chip level values here. So it's easy to calculate the results, but in the curves, we give the forward voltages at, as measured at the power terminals. So we're actually including the effect of those parasitic resistances here. And this is really important to note because other manufacturers may include, may just have chip level voltage drops in their figures. And so you would get the impression that these are much higher, but you have to look at that VF at chip level that you can plot from these values and then multiply uh, the 
the, the current at that point times the slope resistance all the way along here to, to actually see that difference. So something to keep in mind when you're comparing data sheet curves. Uh, moving on to, to the gate of the device, we have the gate emitter threshold voltage, uh, which can be thought of as the voltage where the device begins to turn on. So if we look at this curve here, we have gate voltage in red and collector current in blue. Note that we're talking about a very small amount of collector current where the device starts to turn on for the uh, gate uh, emitter threshold voltage, so 18 milliamps. A little more interesting is the value that's not listed, which is why it's in black here, the plateau voltage. Okay, and that's, as you can see, the volt gate emitter voltage where IC NOM can be expected to occur. So in this case, 450 amps. So uh, if you're interested in that, you can go to the typical transfer characteristics curve on the data sheet. And you can see here I've plotted our VGE threshold is way down here at 5.8 volts, but up here at 9.6 volts, uh, if, for example, with a 300 amp device, um, if this were a 300 amp device, uh, you'd be up here. So there's a, there's a big difference between uh, that gate emitter threshold voltage and the voltage at which you see significant, well, very high uh, collector currents. The uh, parasitic capacitances within the device are given in the data sheet, and these are uh, interest. These are you know standard terms that you've seen from textbooks and whatnot, and these are interesting if you're trying to build a behavioral model of the device. From a design standpoint, it's the gate charge that's much more critical as this is what determines the uh, amount of power you need to supply to the uh, from your gate driver. So gate drive, uh, gate charge is given at a particular uh, gate emitter voltage here. You can see negative eight to 15 volts is the transition during turn on. And you can see on the curve there, then if we're going from negative eight to 15 volts here that we have that full 2550 nanocoulomb charge but if you're going to use a unipolar gate uh, voltage to drive this that's zero volts on 15 volts on you can see that that needs to be adjusted because we're not moving as far along the curve and we have a much smaller gate charge so once you've determined which gate charge you're, you you have based on your drive voltages, it's it's simply a matter of multiplying that gate charge in coulombs times switching frequency to get the average current that your gate driver needs to supply. So 10 kilohertz times 2,550 nanocoulombs gives you about 26 milliamps. So. The next value you'll he see here inside the power module, uh, we've got additional gate resistors, okay? And these gate resistors uh, are used to improve the behavior of the IGBTs, uh, particularly when we're paralleling chips inside the device. Uh, in some cases, these might be discrete resistors, you know, surface mount resistors inside the module, but more often than not, they're actually integrated into the die, the IGBT die itself. Um, so some examples are shown here for different IC NOM size chips, uh, uh, fourth generation IGBT here. Um, and so uh, in the case of our 450 amp module that we're looking at right here, uh, we have three 150 amp chips in parallel. So our effective RG int that gets printed on the data sheet is 1.7 ohms. So this RG in is used for calculating the peak current that flows in the gate circuit during each switching cycle, so helping determine the peak current your gate driver needs to supply. Uh, but because this is internal, you can adjust it. Um, all of the references to gate resistor that we'll talk about in a minute on the data sheet refer to the external resistors that you as a user would apply to the module. And so uh, there's no need to add or subtract RG int from the RG values that we talk about in a minute. So the switching characteristics in this area of the data sheet give the best case dynamic behavior of the IGBT. If people look to VCE SAT when comparing conduction losses between modules, they'll look at the E on and E off here uh, to judge how good the switching losses of a module are. And since smaller gate resistors generally give faster switching times and lower losses, the turn on and turn off gate resistors that you see here, 1.1 ohms, 
um, represent the minimum values that we recommend as a module manufacturer. So when comparing these switching characteristics to other data sheets, it's important not only to consider these gate resistors, but also the switching conditions under which these measurements were made, such as the DIDT during turn on, the DIDT during turn off, DVDT, and the stray inductance that we have in our system when we're measuring. Additionally, uh, when we're talking about rise time, delay time, fall time, we use IEC standard 607-47-9 to define those values. So it's, it's always measured at a similar point in the waveform. Um, and that's not always the case between manufacturers. So it's good to check uh, where they're measuring. That's just a snapshot of the energies, right? This is only measured at one point and represents the best, best case. Uh, we have much more detailed characteristic curves here because these uh, switching losses vary with gate resistor and current. So the same caution from the previous slide applies where you need to make, make sure you're looking at the same measurement conditions when you're comparing these from one module data sheet to the other. In this case, these are all given at 600 volts. Uh, and uh, plus or minus 15 volt for the gate drive and they're hot. They're at the maximum operating junction temperature of 150 degrees C. And to reiterate an earlier point, the gate resistors we refer to here, RG, are the external gate resistors that the user applies. You do not need to worry about RG int that we were just talking about. Um, and lastly, the switching losses are temperature dependent but the relationship is not apparent from the uh, data sheet that, and, and the values that we gave at one point. So I'm showing you here for uh, fourth gen IGBT devices, um, this coefficient uh, applies. So you can see if you scale that to uh, 25 degrees C operating temperature, if you were ever operating that low, you can see that the switching uh, losses are 62% of the, the data sheet value. So switching losses for the diode are also listed in a similar manner. And the switching turn off of the IGBT, uh, of, the, uh, of the diode, the turn off of the diode corresponds to the turn on of the IGBT. So you need to consider the RG on listed in the previous uh, IGBT section when we're looking at this. And when the diode turns off, it goes through this reverse recovery that peaks at IRRM, reverse recovery maximum. And the area of that curve uh, dictates the reverse recovery charge, QRR. And again, note here that we rely on an IEC standard to define the time across which we're doing that integration. So that's important to, uh, uh, to note. And so if you're doing any sorts of measurements in the lab, like you have your current here and your voltage coming across and you'd multiply the two and then take the integral to get your switching energy, your reverse recovery energy here, E, uh, you gotta make sure you're uh, integrating over the same period as, as we've, we've noted here to get the same amount of area under the curve. So uh, similar to the IGBT, we also have curves that give a little more detail for the diode. Uh, now the effective circuit DIDT and diode reverse recovery losses is explained in more detail here. And as mentioned, the gate resistor reference here is the turn on gate resistor for the IGBT. Um, when, we, when we look at these RG values here, up, up here and then along here. And uh, you can see that the uh, DIDT that you look at here is a function of the inductance in your circuit. So you have to consider that. Um, and we can go directly to the reverse recovery charge here for a given uh, DIDT and a given gate resistor here. Um, again, when you're comparing between data sheets, to reiterate, I sound like a broken record, always make sure we're talking about the same voltage and the same DIDT point. Um, so uh, similarly to the IGBT, we don't give temperature coefficients in the data sheet, but for Cal diodes, it's this 0 0.006 value shown here. Uh, if you ever have any questions about that, please let us know and we can let you know that you're using the right value for um, your temperature changes. <laughs> 
So the topic of thermal resistance here is complex enough that we could, we have a separate application note. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd like if everybody's interested to have a separate presentation on this topic. But for the purposes of this presentation, we're just going to look at two values here, uh, per switch and per module. So for each device, either the IGPT or the diode, we have a thermal resistance measured from semiconductor junction J to case. C. So since this is a base plate module, the underside of the base plate is considered the case. Now, if we consider each diode and IGBT to be thermally isolated from one another, which is a big assumption, we can define a thermal resistance from case to sink S. That's this value here. And since the that path, okay, from case to sink includes a thermal interface material, uh, we have different values here depending on whether you're using like a white oxide grease with a lambda of 0.81. In this case, we use Wacker Chemi P12, but it's a lot, it's, it's pretty similar to stuff like Dow Corning 340 or those traditional white greases. Um, or a phase change material, right? We use a HALA uh, phase change material that's a, a waxy consistency at room temperature, but gives better thermal performance, so we also give a value for that. Um, as mentioned, though, these values don't include any thermal coupling between the devices, so these are really only valid for chopper, uh, buck converter operation, or in the case inverter, like uh, zero hertz operation where you're stalled. Uh, nevertheless, these are per switch values that you'll find uh, from different manufacturers, so they're important to consider uh, when comparing, I suppose. Um, Lastly, although it's beyond the scope of this presentation, uh, we, we really have to be careful about where we measure case or sink, uh, because that varies between manufacturers and even Semicron has changed uh, one of its sink reference points over the years. So whenever you say T-sync or T-case, the first question is where are you measuring it? Now, the second set of thermal resistances that we have at the end of the data sheet under module are given, of course, per module. Uh, and the first values here are theta case to sink one, okay, is the case to sink thermal resistance without accounting for any thermal coupling between the switches, just as we did in the last slide. So in fact, if you take those per switch values for IGBT and diode using the standard thermal pace that we saw earlier, and you treat them as four resistors in parallel, right, the 0.03 Kelvin per watt and the 0.025, and there's two IGBTs and, or two IGBTs and two diodes, uh, you can calculate that value that you see right there. It's a simple, uh, it's a simple equation there just to calculate that. So that's really a theoretical value. It's used by a lot of manufacturers, but the problem is it's sort of artificially low, okay? A much more realistic approach is to calculate the fact, uh, calculate the thermal coupling, because obviously the heat from the IGBT can get into the diode that's right next to it inside the module. And we've gone through a lot of trouble to determine those values through measurement for each module. And so these R theta case to sink two values that you see here include thermal coupling between the devices. And how much thermal coupling? Well, it's about uh, where if about 40 to 80% of the total module losses are in the IGBT and the remainder in the diode. So you could you could say, looking at that, you could say, oh, about a 50-50 split. And this, this really is the case for most inverter circuits and most of the common circuits, uh, common operation that's out there. Uh, and again, we give two values because we're accounting for two different thermal interface materials, you know, Wacker Chemi P12, the white grease, and uh, Hala P8 or HT here, the um, uh, phase change material. So we've talked about thermal resistance, um, but the transient thermal impedance is also defined. So that's how this thing reacts dynamically. Um, unfortunately, we only really give it as a, a graph, okay? So in figure nine in the data sheet, we have the transient thermal impedance for both the diode and the IGBT. And this is the step response to a power pulse that we've done from about 0.5 milliseconds up to 10 milliseconds. And since it's really, really hard to measure this at short, with short pulses, particularly because, uh, you know, finding a measurement device with a 
proper response time is, is not is not so easy. Um, the values below 0.5 milliseconds are calculated. So there's a Z theta junction to case curve for each diode in IGBT. And in the case of a base plate less module, such as the mini skip, you know, or our semi tops or any module where the thermal impedance is measured from junction all the way down to sink because there's no case, uh, we'll also include the effects of um, uh, the thermal interface material here. So for a mini skip data sheet, for example, you might see four curves uh, on here, or maybe even six curves that show uh, the response based on the um, uh, what thermal interface material is used. So from these curves, you can derive the time constants and uh, resistances that you need to build up a foster network. We, we use uh, generally use a foster network rather than a cower network, but you can use either. Um, and if you would, if you're not able to derive these values and you'd like them directly, you can calculate. You can contact us, and we'll give you the tau and our theta here, so you can make your own uh, behavioral network. Finally, uh, we come to the section of the uh, data sheet where we're describing the thermal sensor that's available in some modules. So in the case of the Semix 3P, we have a little uh, temperature sensor that's mounted on its own little island, uh, electrically isolated from the rest of the, the power module inside the module. Um, and these sensors can either have a positive or negative temperature coefficient, which you can determine pretty quickly by looking at the, uh, the, the room temperature here, 5K versus the hot temperature, 100 degrees C, which is the 493 here, um, to determine that it's a negative temperature coefficient. And uh, the temperature, the response of that temperature sensor is nonlinear and can be approximated with the equation we show right here. And we use a B or beta value um, as a constant in there that's given right here. And note that this value is given over a very a specific range here, 100 to 125. And uh, because the temperature sensor typically is used as an over temperature fault, that is, you know, if this temperature sensor got to 115 degrees C, that's where the junction temperature might exceed 150 degrees C based on your cooling conditions and operating conditions. Um, because of that, uh, we, we give the beta that gives the least deviation at that 100 to 125 degrees C. So um, if you were trying to use this only at low temperatures for whatever reason, uh, you might want to use it, uh, you might want to find the different beta value for that uh, sensor to determine that. So, uh, with that, I'd like to conclude this very quick run through our data sheets. I know I spoke fast and I flipped through the si slides very quickly, uh, but as we said, we will give you this presentation uh, and we'd love to have you reach out to us and talk more. Um, and also a lot of the topics I touched on are described in much more detail in these application notes here. And so the PDF you get will have links to these. These are free, they're on our uh, website. And uh, a lot of what I discussed is also in our application manual book. It's a free book, you can download it, or if you meet us, we'll give you a, a hard copy. So uh, I'm very thankful for all of you for listening and also to my colleague, Dr. Arndt Vintrick, from whom I pilfered uh, the majority of this presentation. Well, thank you, Paul. Yeah, for a great presentation. Um, and I, I did just share the, uh, the PDF version of this presentation. And earlier I shared the data sheet for the module that you were speaking about. Um, and actually we have received a few questions so we can go through those uh, next. So let's see. Um, I'll start off here uh, with a simple one for you. Is the thermistor isolated from high voltage? In the case of this module here, and uh, a number of our modules, yes, the thermistor is physically isolated from uh, the high voltage circuit. So in the case of the Semix module, it sits on its own little substrate. Um, and uh, uh, it it will withstand the same isolation voltage V ISO that we described earlier. 
Um, however, uh, for, because it's so close to the uh, high power circuit, it may be that the spacing that's there doesn't qualify for reinforced or uh, double isolation and things like that according to the IC. So we need to give, if you're designing a circuit, uh, you need to consider some additional isolation. Uh, in the case of uh, some of our newer products like Skip4, we've actually put the temperature sensor down on the same substrate as the, the chips, but we're able to do the electrical isolation on our driver. So uh, to answer your question for this module, it is isolated. Okay, very good. And here's another one um, for the internal gate resistor. So is this um, always concentrated in the gate path or is this also in the emitter path or distributed between the gate and the emitter path? Uh, so circuit wise, it's, it's right in the gate here, but uh, you know, you can, you consider it in series with the gate. Um, now, uh, when we say emitter path, right, because normally there's an emitter connection here that goes back to your driver. Um, this, uh, you know, when, when you're talking about calculating the peak current that your gate, gate driver supplies, you're going through your, your external resistors through the gate and then back out through the emitter. Um, so uh, physically, though, and I guess circuit wise, you, you should consider it to be in, in series with the gate because it's it's not a parasitic. It's something that's uh, intentionally added by the chip manufacturer or by Semicron in the module uh, uh, to, to improve the behavior of the device. OK, and another question here. Is it OK to assume that the diode reverse recovery loss represents the whole diode turnoff loss? Uh, I guess, uh, yes, in the sense that um, that is the that is the only loss that we consider when uh, we're talking about switching losses in the device from a thermal standpoint. Uh, for for any, any device, we talk about conduction losses and switching losses. And in the case of a diode, uh, conduction losses are given by the, the VF0 and RF I described, and the switching losses are given by ERR, essentially times the switching frequency. Okay. And this one, I, I'm having trouble seeing it as a question, but maybe you can help me. So um, it says, what about switching frequency versus IC at TJ Maxx, the characteristic? Switching um, frequency versus IC at TJ Maxx. Switching frequency during IC. At TJ Maxx, make an initial judgment to use a particular power module, and I, it doesn't really have a question here. Just, just what about? So I, I guess that would just be more of a general thing about sizing a module, right? Is is uh, what switching frequency you would use depending on what kind of current you're getting, or what kind of collector current you're trying to switch, and. Um, I guess the short answer is it depends on a lot of things, but what we would do is calculate the junction temperature at that switching frequency and at that current. So many of you have maybe heard SemiCell, our, our thermal calculation tool that uses these data sheet values to calculate the junction temperature. Uh, I, I would calculate the junction temperature and then give you a recommendation based on on what the results are from there. Uh, you know, uh, the, the sort of the dumb answer is the higher you go in current, typically the lower you go in switching frequency simply because of losses. But there's not really a fixed data sheet characteristic that, that we give you there. Because even if we plotted it for one set of operating conditions, it's only valid for uh, that one point. OK. Um, and I'll, I'll limit this to one more question, and the others seem a little bit out of scope here, but how does the Simicron data sheet differ from other manufacturers' data sheets? I can't say that I, I can tell you everything, but I can give you some examples. Uh, one of the big ones I can tell you is that, um, where are we here? The um, Those forward characteristics that I was telling you here, um, I know for a fact that one of the major manufacturers we have put, gives this graph uh, 
uh, for the voltage drop, the forward characteristics at chip level, so that if you looked at our data sheet and their data sheet and you just looked at the graphs, you'd say, oh, Semicron has much higher losses. That's because we've included that RCE value in there. So that's one example. Uh, a lot of the other examples uh, refer to thermal resistances. And so that's why it's worth a discussion on its own. But um, you know, this is where a lot of module manufacturers try to look impressive, right? So uh, these values, where they're measured, how they're measured, and whether or not they include thermal coupling, that definitely differs between Semicron and some of the other uh, major uh, European and Asian manufacturers. Okay. And I'll, I'll end it there with questions, but I'll say that we, we have one or two more out of scope that we will get back to you. And I do have a couple recommendations for future webinars, including uh, protection and gate driver design, and also people agreeing with you that a uh, webinar on thermal resistance would be a very good um, approach. So with that, I'll say, Paul, thank you very much. And uh, to the audience, thank you for joining the webinar today. Um, we hope that you enjoyed it and you could take away some useful information. Um, please join us for our future webinars and have a great day. Bye-bye.